Hello, everyone. Welcome to the PyCon conference. The topic of this session is machine learning to auto navigate websites. I would like to introduce you to our speaker of this section, Markus Nesluth. Hello, Hello, everyone. Welcome to the PyCon conference. The topic of it. Markus is a mathematician, educator, writer, and software engineer at Klarna in Stockholm. Markus, are you ready for your presentation? I am. Great. Then I'll give you the word. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and welcome, everyone. And uh, I guess welcome to PyCon. And I hope you enjoyed the keynote before me. I'm glad to have a lot of people here. Uh, so, um, yes, my name is Marcus. Um, I'm a, currently a senior software engineer at Klarna in Stockholm. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about myself in, uh, in just a moment. But uh, first, I want to talk about this article from Ars Technica that I read the other day. Um, I don't know how often you eat at uh, McDonald's. Um, I rarely do. But the ice cream machines um, are notoriously unreliable, uh, so infamously so. And this was a bit too much for a certain Rashik Sahid, who desperately wanted more information on this uh, phenomenon. So what uh, do you do? Well, he wrote a web service that tries to buy an ice cream at every McDonald's every minute. And the assumption is that if you try to place an ice cream order and fail, that's a signal that the machine at that McDonald's at that moment in time is broken. And that gets stored in a database and uh, rendered on a live ice cream availability website. Now, um, McDonald's weren't too happy about uh, their services getting pulled every uh, minute. Um, but they were happy with the service being uh, trying to do this once every 30 minutes. Um, so with this with this kind of project and uh, all the the type of stuff that I will be talking about uh, in this presentation, it's important to be uh, nice and not to overload the services um, that you're using. So that's a that's a topic for another day. But how did um, Rashik Sahid accomplish this ice cream? scraping uh, website. So according to uh, the article, he went through a lot of trouble to reverse engineer the McDonald's ordering API uh, from their app. Uh, so it would trigger properly from his own web service. Um, that's very, very clever, of course. But it requires an API to actually be available. And there are plenty of situations where uh, an API just isn't avail easily available or um, available at all. For example, uh, you might want to cheat on a chess playing website. Uh, so here's an example where I've connected a chess engine running locally with a uh, website where you can play uh, chess. So the, the website is scraped, and corresponding squares of the board are converted, um, well, corresponding tiles on the board are converted to a format that the engine can process. And then the move that the engine suggests is translated back to uh, what squares to click on. And this is run automatically in a loop. Uh, there is no API available here. So there's, we must access the site uh, via a browser just as a human would. Uh, of course, uh, as a chess player myself, uh, please don't try this at home, uh, since in most places, this is uh, serious uh, cheating. Now, uh, just reading static data from a website uh, is what we call web scraping. Uh, if you want to buy ice cream from the McDonald's store without access to their ordering API, uh, or if you want to be able to play chess, that means uh, not just navigating to the website uh, or the real website, but also clicking buttons uh, for McDonald's, for example, to select the right store, maybe writing ice cream in a search box, clicking enter, clicking the buy button, and then observing you know, whether or not the ice cream order made it uh, to the cart. So we need to also interact with the page. And this is what I will refer to as web automation. So it, it includes scraping, but it is also uh, a lot more. So for the next um, 20 or so minutes, uh, we're going to look at uh, how, one, how one usually sets up this uh, web automation projects, uh, along with some uh, common problems in this field. Uh, uh, and then we'll talk about the solution to some of these problems, which is the Web Traversal Library, or WTL. Uh, we'll look at what that is and what it can do for web automation projects, uh, along with some uh, examples. So what's my 
perspective on this. So Klarna is a Swedish and global fintech company with interesting marketing photos, uh, working to create smooth shopping experiences. Well, part of that is facilitating payments between users and uh, merchants, even with providers or banks where no API is available. In some regions, this might involve logging into a bank's website on a user's behalf to issue a uh, transfer of funds. Now, I myself am originally a mathematician from Uppsala University um, that early on ventured into the uh, IT world. And two and a half years ago, I joined Klarna for a then newly founded uh, ML research team to experiment with uh, particularly web automation. Um, the question was, how well can you for example, collect data or interact with, or maybe test uh, Klarna integrations, et cetera, on uh, other types of uh, websites. Um, for example, something close to Klarna is uh, e-commerce websites. Um, so this is all simple, right? The, the problem is the web is a messy uh, place. And there are literally millions of e-commerce websites uh, in the world, uh, some Estimate this to be uh, they estimate the number to be as high as 24 million uh, online stores in the world, and they're all different. So a simple script that uh, tries to automate some task on an e-commerce website needs to be custom tailored to each specific you know site, uh, just because they're all different. Uh, and even if you could do that uh, millions of times, these websites also uh, change from time to time, uh, and sometimes uh, very often. And we've all, we've all been there ourselves. Some UX designer decides to move the login button from one side of the screen to the other, and suddenly uh, we're all very confused. Uh, and a tiny, tiny change like that is going to break whatever hard-coded script that you've written, and you'll, uh, a developer will have to manually fix it. And eventually, you'll spend all of your time rewriting the scripts that um, have broken, and you have no resources left to actually support new sites. So doing it uh, in this sort of manual, hard-coded way just doesn't scale. To avoid that sort of a limit when it comes to web automation projects, we wanted to use the latest ideas from reinforcement learning and build up a smart agent that could um, understand and use a website, uh, it had, even websites it had never seen before, just as a human would. So think about the um, chess playing uh, bot, or think uh, think about the steps that you would take to order an ice cream uh, online, and how to translate that to a machine. So we start by, of course, navigating to that particular website, but then we need to, uh, in a loop, essentially, we need to scrape data from the page. So that includes both the text that's available, all the HTML elements, um, maybe also visual information, like uh, a screenshot of the page um, or resources that are downloaded from the server, et cetera. Uh, once we have that data, we need to process it somehow. So we need to organize it uh, in some uh, convenient format so that we can run it through either some uh, hard-coded instructions or some kind of machine learning model uh, or something. And that, uh, that model will generate some, uh, hopefully, um, compute some sort of action that should be taken uh, on the website. That action is something like clicking this button or filling out this form, uh, et cetera. And once we have that action, we want to execute it. And uh, after that, we need to observe what changes were made to the site. So is it different? Uh, did we end up on a new page? Did we trigger some changes to the page? And is this new state closer to whatever our end goal is? And then we essentially repeat this cycle over and over. We scrape the page, uh, we process that, we take a new action, and so on. And at some point, hopefully, we've reached uh, a goal. Like we managed to buy an ice cream, or we managed to find out that we can't buy an ice cream, or we won the chess game, uh, or something else. So there are two major parts to this uh, idea. There's, uh, on the one hand, data, on the other side, uh, instructions. So data, um, but with that, I mean the, with the website itself. So it's an HTML document um, it's, uh, that contains all the, the structure. It, it, it's uh, CSS files that uh, style the page. It is uh, JavaScript that creates some sort of uh, interactivity. Uh, and with some frameworks, actually you know, build the site, uh, client site. 
there are cookies uh, and other forms of session data that maintain some sort of client-side state. Um, and there are images. And by images, I mean both in terms of um, static resources that are sent from the server, but also uh, the final rendered version of the page. Uh, and this is, um, this is usually very important information. And this is why we don't need a full browser uh, to encompass all of this. Uh, we can't generally just get by with a raw HTTP request to a web server, for example, because we are accessing websites the way a human would. Now, for automating a browser, there are plenty of libraries uh, available, uh, like Selenium and Puppeteer and so on. Um, a normal Python approach is uh, Selenium. It uses the standard uh, web driver interface to connect to a Chrome or a Firefox instance or something like this to both read data but also execute arbitrary JavaScript. So it's meant to be very low level, um, but that means that using it uh, can also be challenging at times. So for example, consider just clicking a button. It's not as easy as you might think. Uh, while there is a, a click function in JavaScript, um, as anyone who has worked with front-end development will know, there are many, many ways to uh, create a button or something that looks like a button or something that is regis registered to have an uh, on-click JavaScript handle and so on. Uh, currently, the most fail-safe snippet I've managed to find to issue a click uh, programmatically is several hundred lines uh, of JavaScript. Uh, my, my apologies, by the way, for bringing non-Python code to a Python conference. I promise it'll get better soon. But similarly to uh, clicking, uh, similarly, you can't always fill out a text field by just changing its uh, value parameter, for example, because websites do scan for this type of behavior to prevent spamming. Um, they might block you because you're using a website at superhuman speeds. Um, sometimes I'll see whatever user agent or properties of your current browser session uh, and block you before you can even enter the page. So even doing simple things like this uh, at scale in a robust way uh, can be tough. So Selenium is powerful, no doubt. Um, but it's, it's very low level, and you don't want to be reinventing uh, these things every time. So that covers data. And on the other side, we have uh, instructions. That is, what do we want to do with the website once we have access? Uh, now, some things we can hard code, um, as in previous examples, for example, with quite some good success. Um, form filling is, is one of those. That's in most password managers and browsers already. And looking for credit card fields on a page, for example, means looking for specific credit card related names in elements or attributes of elements or adhering to some formal or informal standards. And what we learn from that is that websites generally are made to be understandable um, uh, by humans, of course, but, but uh, understandable nonetheless. Um, websites are predictable because humans are quite predictable. And as developers, we want reasonable variable names in code. Um, we also want websites to be useful for password managers or screen readers, et cetera, because that helps accessibility and it helps drive uh, traffic. But if you want something that's um, smarter than the hard-coded scripted solution, uh, something that's robust and adaptable to changing websites, um, we can go the, uh, the ML route. Um, for example, we can train neural networks to feedback information about a page, like. I think this page is of this type, or I think this button is most likely to get me to towards my end goal, uh, et cetera. Uh, and on this side, of course, there's uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever ML framework uh, you are using. But there is a gap here between, um, on the one side, a, a Chrome window, and on the other side, mm -hmm. uh, a model, a machine learning model or something more complicated. Uh, there's a gap between data and uh, instructions. Um, there's also a bunch of luxuries that one might want to have uh, on top of uh, the, st the stuff that I mentioned. Um, things like handling multiple tabs or windows at the same time, uh, overall sort of session management, uh, screenshotting, debug information, logging, et cetera. So back in uh, early 2019, uh, my team and I felt that we needed some sort of uh, abstraction layer. Um, we were searching for this missing link between the, uh, the web and our web automation projects, uh, preferably something that was based on uh, reinforcement learning principles, because that's what we were aiming towards. 
uh, but not something uh, locked into that because that's not always uh, what you need. So having encountered the types of problems that I mentioned uh, and more, uh, we extracted the relevant bits into a, a reusable library and that became the uh, Web Traversal Library or WTL. The uh, development name was Web Traversal Framework, which when you think about it had a much cooler acronym, um, but that name wasn't considered acceptable apparently, so WTL uh, it is. Now in, um, in reinforcement learning, uh, the basic idea for an intelligent agent is to scan or observe your environment, process that data, decide on some action, execute that action, and observe the changes that you cause to your environment, and do this essentially in a loop. Uh, and hopefully, by doing this uh, over and over again, over um, in different environments, you can hope to learn to understand what takes you towards your end goal, um, and hopefully generalize into something. Um, we've already seen this translated to a website setting where observing your environment means uh, scraping a page and the action space is limited to things like uh, clicks and uh, form fillings, et cetera. This happens to also be the main uh, loop for the uh, web traversal library. Uh, so we only need to define three key components. So first of all, we need a configuration uh, or a setup that specifies the environment that we're in. Um, and the environment is defined by things like the starting URL. Uh, if we're using a desktop or a mobile browser, if we want uh, debug information, if we're using a proxy, uh, et cetera. Secondly, we need to define a goal function. Uh, and that is that can be something simple, like we reached a particular URL that we were looking for, or we found a particular element, or it's some uh, more complex ML model that says uh, we are done based on the state of the current page. And uh, third and most important, we need a policy function. And this is terminology that comes from reinforcement learning, but it's essentially a function that, as an argument, takes the, the current observations of the current page and returns the next action to take on that page. Uh, and with those components, WTL then can handle uh, all the um, executing of actions, the navigation, the browser interactions, the data storage, the logging, et cetera. Uh, so let's look at a basic Hello World example of uh, WTL. Um, so as I said, we need a, a policy function that uh, computes the next action. Uh, we can just say that, uh, you know, please do nothing. Uh, we need a configuration object, which is the uh, environment that we're in. Uh, we can use the default. Uh, and finally, we need a workflow object. And this is the uh, main entry point that sort of handles uh, all the logic. And we're just passing uh, are uh, constructed objects into that. And uh, and then that is the the, um, the entry point that we run. And finally, we have uh, Python code in this uh, presentation. Uh, so we don't need to define a goal. Uh, and in that case, it will just uh, run forever and ever. Uh, so this example that we have will run, uh, will navigate to pycon.se and then just do uh, nothing uh, in a loop uh, forever and ever. So the things that we get for free in this case um, are what? So WTL will spin up uh, a browser. It will navigate to the given URL. It will scrape the page. It will generate lists of uh, all the elements, all the associated data, um, including things that need to be computed, like coordinates of an element for the given browser size, et cetera. Um, built in are also being able to save um, snapshots and screenshots of the page uh, and data about all the elements. Um, but we need to uh, also enable that. Uh, so let's do that. It's just a, a small change to the uh, configuration object uh, that we have. Uh, and if we were to run now uh, the same thing with uh, these changes, uh, we would also get these uh, numbered folders. So uh, one for every uh, iteration of the loop, so one for every call to the policy uh, function. Uh, and inside every folder, uh, we find uh, a bunch of files. Um, uh, for example, the, um, the raw HTML of the file, we get a screenshot of um, the viewport that the user, a normal user would see, uh, but also a screenshot of the full page uh, from top to bottom. Um, we also get these JSON files with uh, information about all the, uh, about the page, but also about all the elements on the page. And this is 
in a structured format and it's easy to bring into uh, pandas or whatever your uh, data processing framework uh, might be. Um, so currently we don't actually do anything, but um, so let's change that and let's just uh, make a small change to our policy function so that we click a random link at every time. Um, essentially we just do a random choice among all the available actions on this page. Uh, that is a click uh, action. Um, so how do we know what uh, constitutes clickable? Um, for that, we need a, a classifier, um, as we say in the business. And uh, there are some classifiers built into WTL. Uh, one of them is the active element filter, which essentially goes through all the uh, elements on the page. Uh, and uh, for those that are deemed uh, active, in that case, like buttons and active links, et cetera, uh, are assigned a click action in WTL. And then from the policy, we can pick uh, a random choice uh, from all of those. Uh, and if we were to run this example, uh, it's going to, uh, we're going to a different page now, but essentially it's going to um, uh, just go to pick a random active element and click that. And because we still don't have a goal function, it'll do this for all um, eternity, essentially. Um, and as you see, it also scrolls to the right place so we know exactly what's going on. Um, and afterwards, uh, we also get these screenshots that highlight every action that was taken uh, at every point. Um, this makes it very easy to sort of debug uh, what it is that you're doing or what your um, agent is doing. Um, well, let's look at a slightly more complex uh, problem. So what about a pop-up remove? So how would you do that? So each element on a page besides uh, an X and Y coordinate also has a C coordinate, which develop, which defines its height from the page. So how far is it from the screen? And higher means it's more on top uh, of others. So let's find the element with the highest Z coordinate and remove that element from the page. That's um, slightly more complicated, uh, right? Um, well, not really. So we can find uh, this is a small, uh, at the top here is a small JavaScript snippet that computes the Z index for a given element. Um, and then we can, in WTL, create um, at the bottom here a custom classifier that uh, uses this. Um, it essentially loops through all the elements. Uh, for each element, it will execute this piece of JavaScript. And it will return, essentially, a mapping from element to uh, computed uh, Z index. Then we only need to change the policy so that instead of, um, instead of picking a random element, we pick, uh, we sort all the elements by uh, Z index, and we return a remove action of um, the topmost element. And uh, if we look at how this works, um, we see that there is a big uh, cookie banner at the bottom. And if we uh, let this run for, there we go, uh, it's being uh, removed. Now, if we keep letting this run, it will uh, eventually remove the entire page. So let's uh, let's stop. Um, of course, this is not a great pop-up remover, but uh, again, you can use you know reinforcement learning to uh, on the output from several of these runs to maybe learn a pattern of how to uh, close pop-ups, etc., um, or any kind of modal windows. Um, if you're interested in more sort of hard-coded approaches, um, WTL supports that as well. Uh, so the policy doesn't have to be a function; uh, it can also be a, a generator or a coroutine that uh, yields uh, actions as you go along. Uh, and that's especially useful in cases when you know exactly what you want uh, in the workflow or in part of the workflow, uh, like for automated testing, for example. Um, so the last uh, example that I want to show uh, is based on this type of uh, text-based RPGs that were popular in the 80s. Um, there was a talk at PyCon, uh, I think, two years ago uh, by Samuel called Digging Mud uh, in Python. Uh, about this uh, type of text-based RPGs. And based on that, I wanted to, uh, or inspired by that, uh, I wanted to build a similar game with WTL that uh, lets you sort of wander the cyberspace uh, in a, a role-playing fashion. Uh, and this is what I ended up with. Um, so this is essentially what the game looks like. Um, and I can interact with it by saying, you know, I want to uh, look around. Uh, because there are text fields on the page, it tells me that I have a piece of paper and a pen in my hand. Uh, and then an action I can take is to write something. Uh, and if I do write something, that ends up uh, in one of the text fields uh, on the page. 
Uh, I can also, in uh, the classic mud fashion, I can move. Uh, and if I try to move west, for example, it's going to click a link that's on the left side of the screen and so on. Uh, so this is completely meaningless, uh, of course, uh, but uh, I thought it was fun. Uh, but in general, of course, there's no limit to, to what it is you can do. And the main idea is to have this sort of abstraction layer that is easy to use and uh, stops you from reinventing the wheel every time. Um, so we've seen some examples of how to put um, WTL to good use. Uh, and that includes, of course, buying uh, ice creams from the McDonald's store without API access. Um, but I will leave that as an exercise uh, for the reader. Uh, if you're asking yourself if you can uh, use this uh, yourself, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, it's uh, posted to GitHub. Uh, it's also published to PyPI, so you can easily install it uh, via pip. Uh, the only thing you need, essentially, are Chrome or Chromium and uh, Chrome driver installed. There should also be a Firefox support uh, very soon, I hope. So please, um, please feel free to try it out. Uh, I'm very happy to receive any sort of feedback or pull requests that you might have. Um, but that is my time for now. So I'll say thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, if you want to get in touch, uh, my contact details are here, available uh, in the PyCon Slack channels, and I'll be around for the for the rest of the conference. Um, and if there's any time left, I'm happy to answer uh, any and all questions you might have. But uh, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Marcus. It was really interesting while you were presenting. Our listeners wrote some questions regarding the topic. And uh, the first question is, uh, uh, hey, Marcus, how do you interact with a page via RL without using superhuman speed, being blocked, but still being fast enough to run something in a reasonable time? Right. Uh, so, so this, uh, of course, is, is a problem. You need a lot of uh, you need a, a lot of um, a training time to do this. Uh, generally, what you can do um, so WTL will uh, slow down your interactions to make them seem human, but uh, instead you run a lot of them in in parallel. So you use uh, sort of a, a cloud based uh, cloud based solution, and you have a lot of uh, machines running at the same time, and you coordinate that that data uh, to mm -hmm. the same place. And hopefully you can uh, synchronize that in a good way. Um, but yeah, in general, uh, the only way to get around that um, is uh, to use a lot of uh, parallel uh, machines, uh, hopefully over uh, different uh, sites at the same time as well. Good. The next question is uh, super interesting and well-delivered presentation. Thank you. I'm interested in knowing more about the web automation etiquette do the websites only realize uh, it's happening? Um, yeah, so this is a, uh, <laughs> this is a complex question. Uh, in general, uh, it also depends on your perspective on this. Hopefully, um, the website owner wouldn't, like, uh, if you could detect that it is a robot, uh, you might want to block them, for example. At the same time, you might be doing uh, something that ultimately is a service. Uh, to the owner of that service, uh, to that website, uh, and et cetera. So I'm happy to talk more about this uh, on Slack. Uh, but in general, uh, you, do, you do need to be mindful of the services that you are using because you're essentially uh, you're using their bandwidth uh, and uh, ultimately maybe their resources um, for you know, your own gain. Uh, so you do need to be mindful of that as well. Um, but I think it's a it's a it's a complex question that uh, I don't have time to answer uh, completely here, um, and I guess it, it very much depends on which uh, side you're on. If you're on the <laughs> web automation side, or if you're on uh, sort of the uh, person's website being scraped, and uh, what do you get out of it? Uh, yes. Um, the next question is. Uh, um, does uh, WTL work with or include some distributed mining package functions? What do you recommend? Uh, by mining, I'm assuming this uh, refers to data mining. Um, in general, um, so no, um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't come with any of that. Uh, so it tries to be sort of very hardcore focused. Uh, hard, hardcore focused on specifically the the web uh, automation and the the scraping uh, side of things. Um, 
I'm not sure what I would uh, recommend. This also depends, uh, for example, on what uh, what you want to do. Um, as I said, there. Are, yeah, so I'm not sure I can make any specific recommendations on the the data mining uh, side of things because that depends on your use case. But we've used it both for like we've exported the data into uh, to pandas to do some exploration. We've also kind of trained uh, models in. Uh, both TensorFlow and PyTorch and, and those kind of things, and try to run structured data uh, through that uh, with with some success as well. So uh, it depends on, I guess, how how complex you want it. But you get from WTL, you get sort of a clean structured uh, JSON files with all the information about different elements, um, and you can. Uh, there are a lot of settings to sort of add additional data into those files or uh, remove the what you don't need, etc. So uh, there are a lot of I guess, adaptability for what you need. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, uh, thanks for the presentation. One question, how do you work with pop-ups that only come up sometimes? Um, yes, so <laughs> uh, again, so the, the pop-up example that I had, for example, uh, the pop-up remover that I showed, uh, obviously that's a very naive uh, approach and, and uh, uh, as long as if you don't know that there is a pop-up, you can't just remove the top C index element uh, because in, you're going to remove something that's critical to the page. Um, and it's not just uh, so pop-ups is one thing, but um, this is another problem that comes with uh, hard-coded scripted solutions is that um, website owners, uh, they do also sort of A-B testing uh, on their page and they're going to deliver you different uh, pages from time to time. Uh, also, if you're in a cloud environment, for example, if you're running this on um, AWS, for example, you might end up being in a region that gets a, a different page from the page that you're uh, seeing locally, even though you're accessing the same URL. And uh, uh, in turn, you, you, you kind of, what we've been experimenting with well is essentially you know, a pop-up detector. So can you differentiate uh, windows that are pop-ups versus, uh, or any kind of modal windows versus uh, elements that are not uh, pop-ups. And uh, in some sense, you can do, uh, I'm not saying this is the perfect solution as well, but in some sense, you can look for specific uh, keywords in modal windows as well, like they're named sort of modal or pop-up or whatever, as opposed to, to the ones that are not, uh, similar to uh, looking for credit card fields, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this kind of robustness uh, is at the core of the problem. And uh, I unfortunately don't have a golden solution uh, that I can uh, WTL, hopefully, at least as a, a tool for uh, trying to come to grips with those. Thank you. Those were all the questions that we received. Thank you, Marcus, for the presentation. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. <laughs> yeah, thank um, you. Yeah. When we are finished, and uh, you can connect to the next presentation. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.